Uh, thank you so much for having me and thank you for kind of sticking with it uh, at the end of the day. I know 5 p.m. Uh, lecture isn't necessarily on everyone's radar, especially on a Saturday. But thank you very much um, for being here. And it's been, a, it's been really great to, today to see some of the other speakers and to really understand um, some of the topics and the knowledge sharing that's been happening today. So hi, nice to meet you. Um, just a little bit about myself. So I am a University of Bristol graduate. I graduated back in 2017. Um, since then, I have been working in information security. I started off as an ethical hacker slash pen tester and then moved into for kind of from that red team aspect through to blue um, and then ultimately ended up in, in more of a GRC function. I currently sit as head of security services at Opencast Software, which is a software development firm that's actually based in the northeast of England up in Newcastle, um, but we kind of have hubs all over the place. And in my part-time kind of free time, aside from playing video games, I like to do um, data science, which is very, very cool, I know. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you uh, about today is around artificial intelligence. And I'm sure if anyone's playing AI talk bingo, you'll be pleased to know I'm kind of steering away from a lot of the, like, the key buzzwords and, you know, kind of cringy topics around, around this subject. However, to begin with, I'm going to mention Skynet, so you can mark that one off your bingo board there. In order to understand how we apply uh, artificial intelligence to, to, to cybersecurity, we first have to define what is and what is an AI. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of audience participation here, and I'm going to say, raise your hand if yes, AI. Um, i just run through some examples, really. So is Uber AI? No hands raised. Okay, interesting. What about something like Google Translate? Is that artificial intelligence? Raise hands for yes. Interesting. What about something like blood glucose monitors? Would you consider that to be artificial intelligence? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so the reality is that AI consists of kind of seven key topics. And these are that the, the algorithm in place can learn, it can adapt, it can problem solve. It also has a function of reasoning, reasoning and perception, and it's also adaptable to change. It's also fundamentally data driven. So all of these kind of previous examples, they all actually count as artificial intelligence. And in fact, if we consider what artificial intelligence actually is, it's just intelligence, but in a non kind of organic structure. So I just want to walk through kind of some of the, the kind of the key terminology that we, we have here. So artificial intelligence itself is the kind of the broadest term. Anything that can learn and apply the learning that it's kind of been developed is technically called artificial intelligence. Where we go a layer deeper is how we optimize and we allow those algorithms to make mistakes and to learn from those errors. And that's kind of the fundamental principles of machine learning. Um, there's lots of kind of different ways that machine learning kind of branches out um, into kind of deep learning patterns. And kind of that, a subset of that is neural networks, which are made up of um, really, really interesting units or functions um, called perceptrons, which basically perceive and, and perform kind of transformations and functions and solve problems in a unit basis that then coalesce together to make this kind of this really abstract neural network structure. And the whole reason they're called neural networks is because they actually mimic a lot of the behavior of the human brain. So now that we understand a little bit around what artificial intelligence actually is, we can kind of begin to understand a little bit about what kind of problems they can solve. In order to understand what problems we can solve, we first need to know what AI is really good at. And there's kind of no surprises here. So things like data analysis and pattern recognition, repetitive tasks, doing the tasks that we don't want to do or we don't have the capacity to do. Natural language processing is something that's um, kind of a key hallmark of, of artificial intelligence. You know, I mentioned earlier, is Google Translate AI? It is. It's something that's learning and perceiving based on the data inputs, and it's able to transform them into an output. Image and speak recognition. So linking on from kind of Dr. Emma earlier, talking about like the kind of deaf awareness, closed captions are a form of artificial intelligence. 
And ultimately, one of the, the kind of the key hallmarks of AI is the fact that it's good at predictive analytics and automation. But there's also a lot of things that AI is not very good at at all. And these kind of make a bit of sense when you think about them. We are only as good as the data sets that we provide our AI. And quite often, these lack relevant context and a broader environmental understanding is not often included in these data sets. Creativity and innovation is something that AI also struggles with. It's quite interesting because when, I mean, I don't know how many people in the room here are consultants or software developers. A lot of the time when we have client problems, the, the response is, I want to add machine learning in. I want to add AI in. But actually, AI isn't there to facilitate innovation. It's there as a, as a way to kind of enable it through, through simplifying a lot of the, the processes that we previously wouldn't really be that interested in, in performing. So a lot of those big mathematics bits. Adaptation to unforeseen circumstances and error handling is something that artificial intelligence is really bad. We come back to that point of we are only as good as the data sets that we, ha that we have available. And ultimately, understanding intent and human motivation. This is something that AI really, really struggles with. And if you think about the field of cybersecurity, this actually poses, poses a really significant problem. If you consider how much kind of, uh, you know, threat detection is based upon understanding the intent of a malicious actor, which will then lead to how we define and, and investigate our indicators of compromise. So what does this mean for cyber? So the reference model here is uh, provided by Gartner. It's provided by a Gartner Insight paper. Um, and I think it really, it's really interesting because it does illustrate where artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks fit within the cybersecurity mesh model. And really, it's, uh, it sits kind of, it's not necessarily technology agnostic. So you can kind of see the products kind of sit on the right hand side and there's inputs and outputs from uh, the analytics and machine learning. It's also fed by threat intelligence. We're only as good as our data sets are. And really what this demonstrates is how it can, this kind of security intelligence layer can really add and enhance in an organization's architectural structure. So I want to look a little bit at the rise of AI in cybersecurity and really how we got there. So for those who are not aware of kind of the timeline, AI has actually been around since the 50s. It was first defined by Alan Turing. Uh, the first artificial intelligence model actually came out in 1952. It was incredibly um, quite, quite significant in terms of revol revolutionizing um, some of the, uh, the key princi principles behind artificial intelligence. We move through then to the 80s and 90s, where we're looking at intrusion detection and expert systems, and then into machine learning and anomaly detection, which we'll look at uh, in a couple of slides. Into the 2000s, we really start to see a ramping up and a, a real interest uh, in, in artificial intelligence. So looking at behavioral analytics, if we think about this in the context of an organization, things like expected user behavioral access control, UBAC, is a form of this behavioral analytics. Do we expect this person in finance to be accessing this data from this part of the world at this specific time? These are all things that kind of feed into that behavioral analytics that AI is really, really good at, at detecting. And then ultimately through the, the, the last 10 years or so, we're looking at the, the rise of endpoint security, looking at the threat intelligence pieces and the cloud security. And now we're moving into the automated response bit. So this next slide here is uh, the Gartner hype curve. And I, I really like this hype curve. This is based around central government so that it, it will vary depending on kind of the market. And it's about technology adaptation and how, uh, how we basically uh, go through these kind of these levels, this, you know, almost like the seven stages of grief with technology, where we look at those inflated expectations that come out the back of someone finding something new and really exciting. Um, so as you can kind of see on the, the, the far side of this one, um, ca stuff like CASB, uh, we're all quite familiar with, we're quite comfortable with. We're now getting to a point where actually we're able to apply this technology successfully and it's entering that plateau of productivity. Um, where Gen AI kind of sits is almost in is straddling this innovation trigger 
and the peak of inflated expectations. Because everyone, no one really knows at this stage how it can revolutionize working, uh, especially in the field of cybersecurity. So I want to talk a little bit now about the, the kind of the applications of artificial intelligence and actually go into a little bit of the maths behind it. Um, don't worry, it's not too, hopefully isn't too maths heavy. So thinking back to, uh, thinking back to the, kind of that first slide and around what AI is really good at, it's really good at establishing patterns and identifying, um, identifying and recognizing anomalies in data. So one of the uh, examples that I'm kind of going to bring up here is fraud detection with isolation forest. And this particular um, algorithm itself was developed in 2008, and it basically identifies where there are um, anomalies within data sets, which then can be broken down based on this kind of this tree, this falling tree model, to then identify your outliers. And why this is particularly important is if you think about the context of a big financial services organization, maybe a bank, they might be handling thousands and thousands of transactions a second. And using something like Isolation Forest, which then breaks down expected patterns of, of behavior, you can then begin to pull out those, those, those fraudulent activities. We can then be notified and understand um, how a user or how a set of tra transactions should behave versus what they're actually behaving. Understanding these anomalies is, is really important um, within machine learning. So what you kind of get once you apply this, this algorithm is you get these really nice kind of plot and it becomes very, very obvious in these large data sets where you suddenly have outliers. And the benefits of using something like Isolation Forest is that it's efficient, it can handle large data sets, so it makes it perfect for that example of fraud detection in financial institutions. It doesn't require any real pre-training. It's not a model that requires you to do a lot of um, composition analysis of your data sets before you actually insert them. And it can be also uh, performed in both unsupervised and supervised learning models. So when we say supervised learning models, we're talking about we're allowing the algorithm to learn, but we are adjusting the data sets as it goes through its learning process. So there's a level of human intervention. We're, allow it, we're directing it towards the conclusions we want it to make so that our model fits, it, fits its purpose accurately. And it's also able uh, to, to detect global and also local anomalies. So understanding the bigger picture is particularly good at. And I would highly recommend if anyone is kind of interested in data science and interested in, in applying this in their own kind of workspace is to look at the, uh, the scikit and um, uh, pi data uh, talks. So these are a little bit older, so they're 2018, um, but they really, they do really great examples of how to actually utilize isolation forest um, in, in the detection of fraud. The next bit that I wanted to cover uh, is around botnet detection. Um, so for people who are unfamiliar, botnets, they tend to um, compromise large, uh, very large pervasive network systems. Things like IoT devices tend to be very susceptible to them. And how they communicate is they tend to send all of their information out to a, a single command and control center. Um, identifying kind of malicious network traffic as a whole is something that's been around for, for a little while now. And there's kind of, there's two main techniques. So we have signature-based detection and anomaly detection. Signature-based detection has some caveats with it and some, some cons, I'd say. Mostly around if we're constantly looking at a library of known signatures, we have to maintain that library of known signatures. So it's very heavily reliant on up-to-date information, which can then mean that the alerting may not be current for the, for the actual purpose that you're using it for. Uh, the, the other attempt is, uh, is to use anomaly detection, which we've kind of seen previously when we've looked at isolation forest and identifying those outliers in particular. Um, because of the rise of uh, AI, we have kind of almost the next level of detection techniques, which is anomaly-driven IDS. 
It also, one of the kind of the key issues as well around this is the fact that when we have uh, kind of the signature-based detection, we have usually a, a threshold of alerting that needs to be reached in order for that to actually trigger. This can change over time. Knowing what your network baseline looks like is incredibly important for this. Therefore, you have to do a level of statistical analytics, looking at interquartile ranges, mediums, to really understand um, understand how your network is behaving ahead of uh, identifying those that anomalous traffic. So, in in this case with uh, with with botnets. Um, we tend to find that when we're using these statistical techniques to identify this anomalous tra traffic, that uh, we we have to take we have to understand first of all what the baseline is, and then what does not normal look like. Now, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is the fact that AI is really bad at handling errors and really bad at handling outliers. So, actually, anomaly detection can sometimes be quite difficult. And what you tend to get is you tend to get what's known as overfitting, which is shown by figure six on the on the left hand side, right hand side for you guys. And this is where the statistical model will take into account the outliers far more significantly than they actually represent in the data set. So you can kind of see from degree one all the way over to degree 15, you know, a linear to, through to a true fit through to an overfitting example. And there's a huge emphasis on reducing this level of error handling so that actually our understanding of what what is actually anomalous and what forms part of a normal data set um, is incredibly important. So not every AI is actually sensitive to this, um, but you do tend to need to do a lot of exploratory data analytics in order to actually understand how overfitting will, will affect your, your anomaly detection. So how this works in practice is we, we identify that uh, botnets tend to call out to C2 infrastructure, so your command and control, um, where you would fit your AI within, in this case, is in that security intelligence layer that sits above. And what this security intelligence layer will be doing is it will be applying some methodology for identification of, of the, the botnet traffic. And so this is either by anomalous detection, which I've talked about at length, or by community detection. This isn't the only way to detect this traffic, and actually looking at the, the traffic itself could sometimes be quite difficult. Instead, what we might choose to look at is actually the interval and determining the, the kind of the frequency of the pulses, the time to live, things like that. And so different models can be applied within the security layer to, to best fit your organizational purposes. There's been a lot of research on this actually in the, the kind of recently, um, and it's, it's kind of really demonstrated the, the utility of using artificial intelligence to identify tra traffic, um, network traffic signatures that previously we would be blind to. The third one I want to look at is biometrics. So we're all quite familiar with biometrics, but biometrics also represent a really great use of artificial intelligence. So when we look at things like facial recognition, um, we're looking for data sets of the face, or we're looking at, you know, in fingerprint analysis, we're looking at the, gro the grooves and ridges that you see on your fingerprint. What is often a problem is with AI, you will tend to look for the things that are most common. So assuming that, you know, if, we, if we're trying to validate someone's identity, we can assume a large population may have a nose, therefore a nose necess isn't necessarily an indication of, uh, of identity. Uh, something like a nose or eyes or eyebrows, um, these, these basically count as um, what's known as eigenvectors. And if you put them all together, you get an eigenface. Um, Eigenfaces themselves have high degrees of dimensionality. What dimensionality is, is the number of characteristics uh, a data set can have. Um, so what you can get is a lot of confusing data all kind of stuck together. In order to actually drill down and identify what a single eigenface actually looks like, we have to do a thing called principal component analysis. And what this is, is it's reducing the dimensionality of the data set. 
So what we're doing is we're normalizing through one vector. We're doing a uh, principle of least squares on another vector. And what we're trying to do, do is basically reduce the number of dimensions by which our, our algorithm has to process in order to be able to create these images. And so what you end up getting is these quite cursed looking um, eigenfaces. Um, I like the fact that it says predicted bush and then true bush. I don't know why. I find that quite funny. So some of the benefits of using PCA uh, for this eigenface recognition is the fact that you, you reduce the, the dimensionality. What you can see on the far right hand side, you wouldn't be able to tell who that is. Um, using PCA, we can drill down into those data sets and say, this is likely to be, you know, Tony Blair in this, in this context. There's also noise reduction and feature extraction. We're able to build an image. We're able to understand this is what this person looks like. Does it align with our expectations? Yes. And as a result, you get that increased accuracy. And in short, that allows us to get kind of more unique and reliable identification. And also, uh, it, it just benefits the, 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 the authorization piece, the authentication piece that we're, we're trying to enforce through this particular control. Now I want to look a little bit around AI and human collaboration. So if we think back to the limitations of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can actually draw out a lot of what we're good at. And that is very much around the creativity and innovation, knowing what to apply where, adapting to unforeseen circumstances, using that supervised learning model in order to enhance our algorithms, uh, in order for them to respond better to change, and ultimately understanding intent. So what does this mean for security professionals? So if we look at what AI is great for, it's great for data processing, but it doesn't understand context. So how does this impact threat detection uh, where understanding intent is important? You know, I mentioned earlier looking at indicators of compromise. We know that certain advanced persistent <coughs> threats will have certain techniques, tactics, and procedures, TTPs, in place. So understanding the intent will help shape our, our, our models to be able to understand and, and recognize those, t those TTPs. Similarly, with indicators of compromise. It's also really great for automation, something that we pulled up previously, but it also struggles to handle errors. So we've seen that overfitting example where our data points are being skewed massively, our models being skewed massively because of our, our, those outliers. That's got a really significant impact if you're using your, your model to actually have an automated response. So if, if, my, if my EDR detects anomalous uh, behavior, and it completely shuts off a user from the network, what is the impact if that's actually legitimate? So in short, that human intervention is always necessary. And this is kind of how you can build out an understanding of the collaboration between, between AI and humans. So what's next? This is a bit of a cop-out, to be honest. And I was mostly thinking because it was getting closer to six o'clock that people probably switching up a little bit. But the sky is, is the limit. And with the advances that we can have in, in kind of machine learning and developing algorithms for cybersecurity, there's a really great opportunity to be able to optimize a lot of our, our working patterns. So where we can establish, you know, expected usual behavioral analysis, it can help us uh, in a SOC um, to understand whether that user's behavior is, is natural or not. And really what it represents is uh, a really growing field and passion um, with, with people who are, are really interested in developing these systems. We looked back at the, the hype curve and we saw that trigger for innovation. The reason that AI straddles those two areas is because AI often solves problems we haven't even thought about. And quite often that's kind of one of the the main driving forces behind the development and adoption of, of technology. So I've included some resources. I did think this a little bit like a university, university lecture, and I have provided like a resource list and um, some citations for, for everything I've included. Um, but thank you very much for your time, and I'll take any questions. Hello. So with your fraud detection,
an example, mm -hmm. you said that you don't need like pre processing of the data set. Mm -hmm. Would that not just only show you deviations from the level of fraud that you have today? If, if, if yeah. you have 0.1% of your transactions being fraudulent, mm -hmm. are you not going to normalize that in that data set? To an extent. So, in <laughs> that particular example, that's identifying anomalies in, in sort of perfect data. To an extent, you, the reason that isolation forest works quite well is because it begins to, if I go back to the slides, it's probably best. It begins to pull out those areas where there are, there exists kind of fraud already. So where, where you see those kind of normal data, data points that dra kind of drift off, that would be your, your 1% that would be maybe considered your acceptable level of fraud. And what we're looking is the anomaly that sits on the other side of that. Um, there's lots of different ways. Uh, isolation forest isn't the only type of um, algorithm that that is used in this particular example. Um, and so there's lots of other ways that you can kind of do it where you you do normalize the data. But I think as a yeah as a as a offset example of kind of how it could be applied, um, I chose I chose this one for that reason. Any other questions? Mm. Elon Musk decided that um, the, you know, we were all going to lose our jobs to AI. Mm. You know? And then you have people who say AI is going to be fine, we just need to you know, regulate it, and you get people like, this is the end of the world, this is Skynet, yeah. this is, you know. So where do you feel, personally, or like from mm. your job, feel that you know, AI and machine learning is going to be the case? Mm. So I think that was really interesting that that uh, that committee was kind of brought together. I remember because I remember sitting in on the announcement and and listening in, and it's it's good to see, especially the UK, us trying to kind of lead the lead the force um, in terms of getting that quality assurance around AI. Um, one of the things that came out as the, the, off the back set of that that community meet was the fact that actually adjusting education. Um, and I don't know if this is kind of going to expand beyond the UK, but there are there's plans in education to include um, to make sure that people have an awareness of artificial intelligence, but also maybe a bit of uh, understanding of how it kind of applies um, and, and things like, you know, making sure that people are, are best suited for the jobs that there are. So there's like kind of more, I suppose, socioeconomic things that sit around artificial intelligence in terms of its place as a research tool. I think it's great at optimizing and bringing forward um, a lot of technologies. So it's been used in the medical industry for uh, identification of kind of, you know, uh, Alzheimer's, early onset of Alzheimer's, things like that. It's been used in agriculture for, for making sure, for checking beehives for mites. So I think there's definitely a use for it as a tool. Um, but as we kind of mentioned, there are some limitations with it, and that limitation will always require some level of human intervention. Um, and I think that's where, if you can get kind of agreement with those two things, we'll, yeah, we'll be all right, I think. Hopefully no Skynets. Hi. I was wondering, first slide, you had a sort of like shallow AI detail. So yes. Mm. Do you think the progress made over the last 18 months is, is it a continuation of this? Is this a whole new paradigm? Like, the wheel of the world is so completely it's going to different to what we have before. It's, it's always really hard to tell with research because I think if I kind of move back to this one, and you know, this is just this is a slide that just kind of represents adoption of technology within within public uh, public sector and central government. But I think this applies a lot to technology basis and to a lot of the research that's out there, which is where you kind of go through this level of you know having these expectations around a piece of research, and then uh, maybe not understanding how to apply it how, or or actually how to define it really. Um, so a lot of the stuff that is coming out, it looks it looks very similar, but it also looks kind of radically different. So I think what it's gonna what what'll happen is it'll be kind of a period a, a plateau of 
of kind of understanding, you know, what the purpose is, what, how do we actually define that? How are we using it? What are we using it for? Um, and that will really be able to, to kind of redefine where, um, kind of where we are uh, with those various bouts of research. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's with technology, you have that exponential growth in, in, you know, the technology over time. Um, and there's a, a lot of talk as well about that kind of that human AI. I want to call it the event horizon, but it's where you get something that surpasses human intelligence and things like that. And some people say that's 10 years away. Some people say it's 50. Some people say it's never going to never gonna reach that. So it's really down to kind of like a time will tell kind of basis to, to see how these different approaches and different pieces of research actually, actually uh, interact with each other. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, do you think that with the rise of uh, things, devices, and then the development of sensors, do you think that we will reach a point where we can create data sets that provide enough context for uh, AI to uh, become more useful after understanding the context? Mm. Absolutely. So you, one of the key limitations with artificial intelligence is the fact that we are limited by our data sets. And so the more data sets you have with greater degrees of accuracy, the volumes of information that's being processed. Yes, absolutely. You can make those decisions. An area where this is already being kind of applied is actually in healthcare and looking at uh, how we monitor and how we understand the human body um, and what data points we can take from that and Things like the Alzheimer's research that I kind of mentioned, and then also cancer research as well, is already adopting a huge amount of, of artificial intelligence in order to enhance the diagnosis um, of some of these diseases. So I do think it's definitely moving to a point where we're getting enough information in order for it to, to be accurate and to, to increase that level of kind of, yeah, cognitiveness. I think that's the word for it. Um, but once again, it comes back to the intent and what do we want it to do and, and how do we want it to solve the problems in, in how the algorithms will actually begin to take that. A lot of the neural network stuff, which uses perceptons, um, it works on that basis of you'll have, you know, one particular percepton over here doing one particular function, looking at one data set, and then they'll be communicating with another to see, well, what's the impact of my decision? What do I think? What do I predict? And how does that impact this one over here? Um, so, it, yes, in short, it's uh, entirely entirely likely, entirely possible. Cool. Anyone else? Nice. Cool. If you have any other questions or anything, please feel free to grab me. But, yeah, thank you very much for having me, everyone.